Okay, take your Bible, would you? And let's go to Romans chapter 12. We turned the corner in uh, the, the book of Romans that we've been working our way through in chapter 12 and began to look at some applications of all that it has been taught by the apostle in chapters 1 through 11. Um, chapters 1 through 11 is a one of the most detailed, comprehensive explanations of the gospel. It began in chapter 116, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, and that this is righteousness that is ours by faith. And we live in this faith and righteousness. And he goes all the way through chapter 11 in explaining the details of the gospel. Now we turn the corner, we go into some application. And last week we looked at verses 1 and 2. Today we'll look at 3 through 21. But when we looked at 1 and 2, it was a foundation for all that's going to be coming. A foundation that gave us principles to live by, of, 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 of um, looking to God and, and, and recognizing His mercy as a foundation and as a motivation for everything that we do rather than as out of duty, and about giving our bodies as an act of worship to Him. And, and, and understanding these principles is where we are now in chapter uh, 12, verse 3. Now, as I read through this, you're going to see that it's, it's different than what we've looked at before. Now, the question I want you to ask yourself as I'm reading it is, why does He say this? Why this and why here and what, what is the purpose? Everything is by design. He didn't just kind of come up with this and say, well, I think I'll turn the corner here and I'll talk about this for a while or that for a while. Why does he say this? So let me read 3 through 21 and ask yourself that question, would you? He begins by saying, verse 3, for by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as, now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same func function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to me, to, to us, we have different gifts. We have prophecy. Use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhor exhorting, in exhortation. Giving with generosity. Leading with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. Do not lack diligence in zeal. Be fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. Because it is written, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In do, in, for in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil 
with good. It was in 1953 that Francis Crick came home and he announced to his wife that he had discovered the secret to life. And uh, she really didn't give it much thought because he was always saying things like that. The truth was he had discovered a secret that continues to amaze us today with its ingenuity and its beauty and its complexity and its breadth. Francis Crick had discovered a secret that, were, that had to do with the chemical structure of DNA and the instructions that are within DNA to build the proteins necessary for the human body. And it was all encoded there. And he discovered this. Now, we've become very familiar with the double, double helix and the, and the kind of illustrations you see in the books of DNA. But in that DNA is the language of life. Instead of, in, inside of each of these tightly coiled strands of DNA is all of the information that is necessary to, to build the proteins. There's 20,500 different kinds of proteins and, and within the DNA is all of that information that is stored. That would mean that from one cell, the information that is within the DNA of one cell could reassemble an entire human body by the information that is there. That would be your eyes, the color of your hair, your heart, your liver, all of the organs, your skin, everything is the bones, all the different kinds of bones, the many, many kinds, all of it is there. And there is a myriad of parts, each one having a unique function and a unique purpose, and all of them working together in unison. It's an amazing thing. David was not exaggerating when he wrote, It is you, Lord, who created my inward parts. You knit, knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Now, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul uses the human body as an illustration to what goes on in a local church. And it is a fitting comparison because we are, as Christians, and I'm assuming that I'm speaking to Christians here, the, the majority here, that we are united to Christ and being spiritually united to him, which is mysterious, I'll grant you that. But it is just as real as us sitting here today. And we are united to him and his life, and in that we are given, as it were, his DNA. His life is in us. And because of that, we belong to him and we belong to one another. We're all the body of Christ. And so imprinted upon us is the life of Jesus. And the Bible calls us a new creation. We are, um, uh, we are called the church. He's gathering from around the world people to himself. And it's a new, it's a new humanity. It's different than from the first Adam. Paul goes into this in Romans 5. From the first Adam, everybody born of him carries that corruption and that sin. But when you're born again through Christ, Jesus is called the second Adam. And we are a new humanity created in him for a, for a special purpose in the world. And we're going to experience and enjoy the company of Christ and, and the fellowship with God and the, and the Holy Spirit for eternity. And so he's gathering this, this body, and we are interconnected. 
because we're connected to him. So Paul reflects on this in verse 4, where he said, just as we have many parts in one body, that is a physical body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ, and I love this phrase, and individually members of one another. I like that because it, at least in this translation, you know, um, individual, you are unique, but you are members of one another. So it's not just your little island that you do your own thing. We are members of one another. Now, <clears throat> to think of it a little differently, how is this church meeting here today different from, say, a group of people who are going to go to a stadium and watch a football game and hope that their team goes to the Super Bowl? Because they're all together, and they may be rooting, you know, that particular group, got their team colors, wearing their team jerseys, and they're all kind of a little kumbaya group, and they're all together. And there's this camaraderie, there's this united spirit, there's, it's, 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 and it's, um, the air is charged with electricity and excitement and energy, and they're sharing in this moment. And there's a sense of this solidarity. But once it's over and they go out the exit, the question is, has anything really happened to the group that changed them somehow? And no, there isn't. They, they get up, they walk out, they move on. However, here in this assembly today, we are united to a person, Jesus Christ, a living person, and he's here with us. We're not just rooting for a team or something. This is not just a, a, a community group that meets. This is something that's living and it's because Christ is with us, and the Holy Spirit is in us. You see, Christ made a covenant with us, and he sealed that covenant with his own blood, and we belong to him, and it's very intimate and close and real. And not only do we share the same Savior and Lord, together we share him, but we are also connected to each other, and that's why Paul even begins this chapter, again, at least with the Christian Standard Version. He says, uh, brothers and sisters, and he calls us brothers and sisters. But we are also individually members of one another, and we're united to, united to Christ and united to each other. Now, this is mysterious, and it is, but it is real, and we are interconnected with our Savior and I think that the point of this chapter and of this section, verses 3 through 21 and even beyond that, chapter 13, and, and as we move through this, I think the purpose of this is he's, he's given us 11 chapters explaining the gospel, and now he's saying, I want you to display the gospel in real life and I want you to put on display the excellencies and the splendor and the beauty of Jesus Christ. And when a church looks like this, if they do, if they do look like this, it is powerful and very attractive and compelling when people from outside may come in and say, what is going on there? Who are these people? And, and I think that that's what this is all about. This is about us having a, a mutual love for each other, but the glue and the bond is Jesus. It's not that we you know, have some other kind of thing going on here that's attracting us. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who draws us. And, the, and, and so... You know, when a non-Christian walks into a local church, 
if they look like this, they know something different is going on here. This is not just a community group. And, and if they are aware of it, they may be even aware that there is a person here that's present. The living God is among them. And then we put on display Jesus by operating just as is described here, the mutual love that we have, the deep care that we have for one another and concern, the mutual hope and the joy that we have. So it's not a, this is not a political rally, thank goodness. And this is not a sporting event. This is a gathering with our Lord and Savior. You know, beauty is a powerful thing. It is not easily forgotten. Whether you're listening to a piece of music or whether you're even having a presentation of a meal before you and tasting it or seeing a wonderful vista or, or something, you, you know, that is beautiful and it sticks in your mind. So is the body of Christ when it looks like this. And that's Paul's intent, saying, people, I want you to do these kinds of things. And there's a lot here, wouldn't you say? I mean, I, kept, I was reading through it, and bang, 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 one after another, things that he's describing here. But that's what Romans 12 is all about. The beauty, the excellencies, the splendor, of the Lord Jesus Christ put on display within a local church, just an ordinary local church. But something wonderful takes place. Now this is more than just a list of instructions. And certainly there are a lot here, there's a lot here, but we are revealing the gospel when we operate like this. William Tyndale was, um, a pioneer in translating the Bible into the English language. Uh, and he paid with his life for doing that. But he described the gospel this way. He said, the gospel signifies good, merry, glad, and joyful news that makes a man's heart glad and makes him sing and dance and leap for joy. The question I have is that, if the good news, if that, which he described is the tone of Fellowship Bible, does the West Virginia community see us in this kind of way, singing, dancing, leaping for joy? Is that the tone of this particular local church? Because if it is, it is showing the beauty of Christ. Is, is Fellowship Bible Church a, a, a captivating church? Is it fascinating to those who are on the outside? Are we attractive? Are we putting on display Jesus? Do people pause and consider what's going on here? You know, the world's looking for that. They see enough fakery out there. They're looking for the real deal. And a church that looks like this is real. Ray Ortland makes the remark when he thinks about the, the Tyndale quote of what the gospel is. He said, you know, too often there are people who have come to church and they wanted to hear the good news of great joy. And instead, what they hear is strife and bickering and turf wars and the kind of thing that so turns them off that they walk away from a church. And not only maybe they were professing Christians that are now ex-Christians, but some have come to the point where they're anti-Christian because they've been exposed to something that looks nothing like Romans 12. And they say, I don't, not only do I not want nothing to do with that, but I'm going to work against it and they become anti-Christian. So what is it that is required in order to foster the kind of gospel-revealing church? Verse 3 begins this list of things, and 
for the, by the grace given me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly. I think some of your versions may even say sober-mindedly. As God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. The thing that quenches a gospel-revealing church is pride and squabbles and those who are like control freaks who've got their group and they're going to control them and they're like a puppet master. And, and, and those that, that um, foster division. Third John warns the reader of a man named Diotrephes who loves to have first place among them and does not receive our authority. There are, there are too many who love, love to be first, either in their little group or, or, or within even in a, in a local church. And we need to hear this in verse 3 about not thinking too highly of ourselves than we should. And that the reason why we need to hear that in this pretty strong language is because we still carry with us the old nature. And though you're a Christian, while the old nature, that former what the Bible calls the flesh, no longer has dominion over you, in other words, it can't control you, it is a powerful influence nonetheless. And that's all it is, a powerful influence, but it's not a controller. But so powerful is its influence that we end up listening to it and operating in the flesh with pride and with turf wars and the kind of thing that quenches what God wants to do. We're like the people of, of the Tower of Babel, seeking to make a name for ourselves individually and sometimes even as a local church. And that... Um, that's kind of ugly, you know? Uh, the world doesn't even, it can smell it and, and doesn't like what it sees. People that gain control and power and position. I, I, I've been a pastor for over 40 years and I've seen a lot of situations and people who love a certain amount of power. And as a young pastor in my 20s, um, you know, I was sitting on the board and seeing people in position of power, just the ordinary people. You'd have thought they had a kingdom. But they loved that, and they weren't going to give it up. And, uh, you know, I'm just a young guy trying to figure all this out, what's going on around me and hearing these kinds of things. Or other times there are people who love to have political maneuvering in order to have their way, their ideas. And uh, others will use their financial contributions to the church. And they make it known that by my gifts, you people exist. Otherwise, you would go down the tubes. And aren't you lucky to have me around to be able to fund this church? And that kind of thing is exactly opposite to what he's saying. I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, he said, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, what does he mean about thinking sensibly, or sober-mindedly, and the measure of faith? Well, I, I think what he's saying here is that each of us needs to conduct a kind of a personal, proper self-assessment, keeping in mind their, their personal gifts that God has given to them and the abilities that he has assigned them and recognizing that he's in charge and not us. The gifts that he's describing here later are, are, are gifts of grace. In fact, that's the word, charis from which we get the word charismatic, describing somebody whose personality is a charismatic personality. There's something grace-filled about it that draws like a magnet people to them, and they're charismatic. Well, in this way, we have gifts 
that are given to us and loaned to us by God. He owns them. We don't, although sometimes there are those who think that they do. But Paul's point here is that when a church is displaying the gifts as God has assigned to them in the way they should, and they have had a proper assessment of themselves and of the measure that has been given to them when a church is doing this. It's a beautiful thing. And people see the Lord Jesus Christ in our midst. Not people who are puffed up with pride and promoting themselves, but people who are serving one another. And in verses 6 through 8, he describes a few of the areas where you may be, you may be best suited to serve. There are other lists in Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12. Um, and this may not even be exhaustive, even in those three uh, portions. Um, I think, you know, what we see with the, the worship team, I think that's a, a spiritual gift even though I don't see it in the list, you know, by leading worship. But I, I could see that as being a special God-given gift that somebody has. So if we, I'm not, and I'm not going to break down the whole list. Uh, you, you're going to have to do that on your own. But I will mention some principles of how we apply some of this. And the first is that every believer has been endowed by the Holy Spirit with a special gift. And I would include children in this. Those who are, are kids who have been born again. And I remember what it was like when I was a kid um, and growing up. Now, obviously, I wasn't doing at age seven what I'm doing today. But I think that God was shaping me, even as he does with our children. And in, especially in the company of others in the home who love Jesus, and if it's a God-fearing home. And you'll see the Lord, in fact, you may even see within that child just hints of things that kind of give you a clue to say, oh yeah, that child has this particular gifting and bent. And, and it's, it's, um, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And we're just managers of this. We don't own it. We're accountable to Him. So that's the first thing. We're endowed, everybody, every Christian is endowed with a special gift. But secondly, we're called to engage these gifts. And not to do so is to diminish the health of the body. So that if you've repeatedly been invited to be a part of something and you have always given an excuse to say, nah, I don't think I will. Um, the whole body is affected by that. Even as a human body, if some member of your human body said, I don't think I want to function anymore, what happens? Well, not necessarily. Sometimes you have to go on medication. <laughs> you know, your pancreas stops working you have to take medication. Your thyroid stops working, you've got to go on medication. Thankfully, we have those medications today. But you don't want a member of your body, especially your eyes, for instance, saying, you know, I think I don't want to work anymore. I'd rather not. Well, the whole body would suffer. So if you're, you've been given a gift, then serve and um, do a proper assessment of yourself and then get busy. And then thirdly, use your gift um, as a means of your own personal growth. I think it's wonderful to see somebody who has been up to this point sort of sluggish in their Christian walk, maybe even critical. And the question I would have to them is, are you busy in something significant in some ministry? Because the way you're acting and what you're saying would tell me that you're just sitting and soaking and you're not busy. Because if you were busy, you wouldn't be thinking like this. You'd be thinking outwardly. And, you, and you, we need to hone and sharpen that, that edge and with joy and zeal and we need to have a good workout. And that means getting busy. Another uh, uh, point here, 
and number four would be, uh, nothing is more fulfilling personally than being useful in some way and knowing that God is using you. It's a wonderful experience. Now, I get to see that once in a while. But it's great to be able to, to know that you have enriched somebody's life because of your giftedness, using it, or they've been refreshed and the Holy Spirit has been using. It's very humbling. And then number five, an observation is that we need to be quick to give God the glory whenever we see the gift that he's given us useful in the body of Christ. Paul did this. Paul was a genius. You just need to read this book and you see that this guy had a brain. I mean, he could really think and think on a whole deeper level than the, than the rest of us. This is a masterpiece. And as bright as he was, he was always quick to give God the glory. For example, Colossians 1.29, he says, I labor to proclaim Christ, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. So he recognized, it's not about me. God's been using me. So how about you? You've been fitted for service. Are you using it? And perhaps you're even thinking now, but I'm not sure where I'm best suited. Where do I begin in all of this? Well, I would caution you as somebody who maybe has been around the block. I would caution you not to overthink this. Um, I used to overthink it. I'd take all these, you know, spiritual gift inventories and thinking, really, is that me? Um, don't overthink it. Uh, the head of the church, Jesus, is not playing some kind of game here. Guess what your gift is? He doesn't work like that. So, for example, if you've been invited to serve in some capacity, uh, don't turn it down because it may be the providential hand of God who has invited you to be a part of something that he wants you to do. So don't be too quick to dismiss it because you may miss out on an investment opportunity. Uh, and don't do that. Furthermore, if you're unsure of what you're good at and what's a good fit, find a mentor who will come alongside of you, who you give the permission to tell me honestly what you think. You know, sometimes we don't want to hear that. But you tell me if, if, if this is my thing, or if it's not, like I've told you in the past, there are certain gifts I'm not good at at all. And I'm not going to go into that, but just to let you know, there are some things that if I had a mentor, they would have to be honest enough to say, this is not your thing. Get out of it. Go find something else. On the other hand, to say, yeah, this is precisely what God created you to do. And so we want to find a mentor. Timothy had Paul. John Mark had Barnabas. And we also could look for a mentor. And then the next would be look for the evidence that the Holy Spirit is the one who's blessing this. Because if you're affecting lives for good, then it may be that he's confirming that this is what you've been called to. Um, but at a minimum, just start helping. If, if there's something to do, pitch in and help. I think that the church is just filled with people who have the gift of helps. Praise God for you and the gift of giving. Because if it weren't for you, there'll be a lot of things undone. But it may be that for you who have the gift of helps, you are no happier than when you're just doing just ordinary things. And oftentimes they're not seen by anybody because they're private. It could be that you, you, you're you part of a project or you're ser serving in somebody's house in some way, assisting uh, in providing some of the skills and talents and gifts, maybe providing transportation and maybe using um, what God has given to you in, in plays that nobody sees. But that's verses 3 through 8. When we turn the corner in verses 9 through 21, I think you could feel as I was reading it, 
that the entire tone changes. The sentences are much shorter. It's very staccato, one after another after another. And you might be thinking, what's he doing here? Well, what he's doing is he's showing us um, a, a, a list and, and, a, and a way of expressing the, the presence and the beauty of Jesus Christ among us. And so I'm going to leave you to thoughtfully read and study these, but I just want to mention two, okay? I'll, mention, I'll do the bookend. We'll go first to, to verse, ni <clears throat> verse 9 and then 21. But heading the list, he says, let love be without a hypocrisy. I wonder if Paul had seen in local churches that he had visited where there was an acting going on, where people presented themselves as being loving, but he could look at him and say, I don't know if that's real or whether you have an agenda of what you're saying and how you're presenting yourself, if really there's, there's something else going on here. Judas was a pretender, and Ananias and Sapphira were pretenders, and it didn't end well for either one of them. And so we need to be very, very careful about this. And, and uh, it's James and also the book of John. This says, look, you don't just tell somebody, hey, I'm really hurting for you. I hope things get better. But if you have the capacity, we need to show love and, and jump in and help them. And then Paul goes on in the next portion of verse 9, detest evil, cling to what is good. Are you surprised to see in the same sentence the word love and the word detest? You think, what do they do? How do they work to go out together? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that the hatred of evil arises in those who are devoted to the good and dev devoted to, to, to love. Um, and and there, there may be that, uh, you know, among us, some of us are thinking, well, we live in a day where it feels like um, evil is exalted. And, and how can we change the momentum of all of this? What can just ordinary people like us do within our own community or our own campus and school, university or high school? And what difference can we make? Well, that's where we jump down to verse 17. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Is this naive? Is this just too simplistic? Or does this really work? Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good? Paul would suggest, and, and the life of Christ shows us, that while you may not stomp it out, there, is a lot, there are a lot of people that are influenced for good. And it changes their whole mindset regarding the Lord Jesus and regarding truth and regarding Scripture and regarding uh, God Himself. And so we need to be proactive. Uh, verse 14, bless those who persecute us. That's what he's talking about. Conquering evil with good, blessing those who persecute us. Verse 17, personally, do the honorable thing in public. And even with those who despise us, do the honorable thing. We see a lot of dishonor going on today. So we need to do that which is healthy and honorable. And then verse 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody, including those who mistreat and who may despise the gospel. But live at peace. Verse 19, leave vengeance in God's hands. Verse 20, serve our enemy when they are in need. And then we turn around the minds and hearts of those by conquering evil with good. Now, according to God's word, this is the way it should be done. And when we operate like this, we display the excellencies and the splendor and the wonder of Jesus Christ. And the world takes notice and says, there's something different. What is it that they have that I don't have? And the answer is that we have the gospel of Jesus Christ.
We've embraced it and we're living for Jesus. So let me summarize what we've learned today. First of all, make yourself available and useful to the church body, just as a human body has many members, but they, they are working in unison. So we are different people, individuals, but we will work together in unison for the health of our body here, of this local church. Secondly, God has given you a gift that's suited for you. Do a personal assessment and understand what that is and think sensibly about it and, um, and put yourself to, to work. And then number four, or number three, sincerely love one another in word and in deed without hypocrisy. And then finally, detest evil and be proactive in conquering evildoers with goodness. This is just the beginning because next week we get into how to be a good citizen. And, and that's especially relevant, I think you would agree. How does a Christian live in a non-Christian environment? Remember, he's, he's writing to the people at Rome. And remember who's the emperor right then? It's Nero. And he's telling these people, I'm going to tell you how to live in this environment to the glory of Jesus Christ, that others may see him. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer and let's ask him to help us to take these practical commands and to put them to work. And may God be glorified in it. Our Father today, we would read through a list and we almost look into a mirror and we see ourselves where we uh, need to give greater attention to particular commands because it doesn't really uh, seem to at the present time fit our either our mindset or, or the way that we are uh, living. So help us, Spirit of the living God, we pray that you would be in charge of changing us and um, and sharpening us so that we look more and more like the Savior. We pray also for those in our community, those that we are individually exposed to or as a church, and we pray that as we seek to honor Jesus, that others might see Him, literally see Him in us. And we will give you the praise for that. It is to your glory that we do this. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.